1. My first impression of you. The door crashed open, shattering the mid-morning calm with the sound like a gunshot. Nathan Zachary's hand dropped to the pistol in his jacket. His eyes checked the room for threats, although his tanned and handsome face gave no indication of any concern. New Orleans was just settling down after the hubbub of Mardi Gras. The tourists who had survived the annual event had gone home. The bodies of those who hadn't were tucked away sleeping peacefully in the local morgues. Zachary had no intention of joining them. He didn't have any enemies in New Orleans, not serious ones anyway. Still, he was a wanted man, and wanted men didn't last long in his business without being ready for trouble. The kid who just burst into the bar was definitely trouble. He was an interesting contrast to Zachary, who stood out in a dive like the Flying Horses bar. Though his attire, a battered flight jacket, a khaki work shirt, matching pants, and polished high leather boots, were common enough among air pirates, he somehow made them look like a million bucks. Like Zachary, the kid was tall and rangy, about 18 or 19 years old. His blue eyes, rimmed with red, burned in his tanned, angular face. Sandy hair, slicked back, offset the kid's leading man features. He wore a pearl-handled cult revolver on his hip. The kid was a pilot, Zachary noted. The back of his leather jacket was festooned with tiny embroidered kill markers, a tradition with some Texas sky bandits. He wore a small squadron insignia, a comical picture of a mock angry crawfish on a field of green and purple, which marked him as a member of the Ragin' Cajuns. The lanky young man took a seat at the bar and kept his eyes on the street. He slapped a handful of coins on the cracked and stained bar top. The barman wordlessly poured a shot of cheap bourbon. The kid downed the shot in one motion, then gestured for a refill. The sound of raised voices from the kitchen startled the young man. He spun around and his hand dipped for his revolver. Nathan's grip tightened on his own gun, just in case. The kid looked edgy enough to start shooting at any moment. Zachary almost laughed in relief when the source of the young pilot's agitation burst in through the swinging kitchen doors. It figures, he thought. It had to be a dame. She was young, 17 or 18, Nathan guessed. The girl was a stunning brunette with legs for days. With a wry grin, Zachary sat back, nursed his chicory-laced coffee, and watched the little drama unfold. The brunette flung herself into the young pilot's arms, and they shared a passionate kiss. The kid ushered her back to the little table in the corner, directly across the room from Zachary. They sat huddled together for a few minutes, their conversation hushed. She was a real looker, who, judging by her clothes, came from money. She had knockout southern beauty, soft waves of dark hair framing a heart-shaped face, skin like creamy magnolia petals, and a wide dark eyes framed with thick lashes. With her stylish, expensive clothes, she was an odd match for the young man's battered leather and khaki outfit. No question this had all the earmarks of a forbidden romance, which meant that, New Orleans being New Orleans, Sooner or later, there would be violence and bloodshed. The capital of French Louisiana was no stranger to violence and bloodshed. Some called it the murder capital of the old United States. Despite the city's fearsome reputation, New Orleans was, in Nathan's estimation, if not a classy town, at least a colorful one. The city was a bit like a tawdry, fading grand dame whose lip rouge was a bit smeared and whose finery was a little tarnished, which suited Nathan just fine. But she had the patina, the sense of history of a European city, something the metallic towers of the Empire State and the blinding lights of Hollywood lacked. 
New Orleans was a proud city, and it showed in the way the locals talked about her, with pride that verged on obsession. Nothing tasted as good or looked as beautiful, or boasted such a storied past as everything in New Orleans. Just ask a local. Even though Nathan Zachary was fluent in French, he could decipher what the locals were saying only half the time. Their accent was a strange mishmash that sounded like a cross between stereotypic southern and nasal Bronx. One moment they were asking, where are you at? And the next, pointing out the location of the Catholic church on the corner. Zachary's ruminations ended abruptly when the young man cursed and pounded his fist on the table. What? What the hell are you saying? The brunette burst into tears and flung her head down on her right arm, while the young man held her left hand up to the light, staring at her ring finger. Zachary was impressed. The ice on the girl's finger could keep a pirate in champagne and caviar for a long time. At the sound of her tears, the young man was immediately contrite. Ah, oh, geez, sweetie, I'm sorry. Come on, Emmy, please, don't cry. When he tried to comfort the girl, she sobbed even harder. Zachary looked away. He was starting to feel like a peeping Tom. He saw the sleek black Packard 1508 touring sedan pull up before the young couple did. The doors opened and two men got out. They were obviously bodyguards, the thick-chested no-neck types, dressed in gray trench coats and fedoras. They carried weapons openly as they scanned the street. They weren't coming into the flying horses for a social drink. One of them, a short fireplug of a man with red, close-cropped hair, opened the right-side passenger door for a tall, well-dressed Creole man in his early forties, who emerged with arrogant grace. He was wearing a dark charcoal gray suit, beautifully cut and expensive, over which he sported a camel-colored vicuna coat. Before Zachary could warn the love-struck couple, the door crashed open and the trio entered. The young man jumped to his feet and drew his pistol. The gunmen crouched and produced guns of their own. The girl screamed! The fire plug flicked off his pistol safety. Drop the gun, boy, he growled, or as God is my witness, you're a dead man. Zachary quietly slipped his own pistol from its holster, hidden beneath the table. The whole scene looked like something on a Tinseltown movie lot, complete with cheap hoods, a hot-headed kid, and a damsel in distress. Except the guns were real. The man in the expensive suit made an elaborate show of handing his fedora to Fireplug. Now, now, Benny, he said, no need to get dramatic. He smoothed the sides of his perfectly cut hair, although nothing on the slightly graying temples was out of place. Emmeline, mon chéri, I had no idea that you knew about places like this. Disdain was etched on his face. Y'all come home now. A nice long bath should wash the stench of this rat hole away. Decane, you can't treat her like she's property. The young pilot was still pointing his gun at the well-dressed man. Listen up, tug old son. I can treat my fiancé any way I damn well please. And right now, it would please me a whole hell of a lot if she just got in the car and came home. He held out a leather-gloved hand to the girl, who was shaking like a leaf. Emmy isn't going anywhere with you, you son of a... Emmy and Tuggy, the city's answer to Romeo and Juliet, eh? The two bodyguards snorted like bulldogs at their master's joke. Get the hell out of here, Decane. Like I said, he thumbed back the cult's hammer. She isn't going anywhere with you. The girl spoke up in a soft, accented voice. Tommy, please, don't do this. They'll kill you. She rose reluctantly from the banquet, her shoulders sagging in despair. I'll go with you, Bertrand. Tommy's head snapped back as if he'd just been slapped. A thin, arrogant smile tugged at the corners of Bertrand Decane's cruel mouth. That's a good girl. You see, Tommy, Emmeline knows who the better man is. The girl stepped toward Bertrand, but pointedly ignored his outstretched hand. 
For a moment, the arrogance fled from Decane's face and was replaced with anger. He roughly pulled the girl closer to him. Nathan watched as Tommy's eyes narrowed and the cult tracked Decane. The damn fool kid was about to turn the bar into a shooting gallery. Zachary was on his feet in an instant. He crossed the bar in two quick strides and locked the kid's arm in a vice grip. Everyone froze, startled by Zachary's sudden, unexpected actions. Pardon me, gentlemen, he said, his voice calm. Am I interrupting? He whispered into the kid's ear. Put the gun away, son. The young pilot bristled. You with them? If I were, you'd be dead now, Nathan replied. Just relax. Zachary stepped forward and placed himself directly in front of the kid. He gestured at Decane's gunman, Benny, with his own pistol. You too, pal. It's too nice a morning for a gunfight. A faint smile crossed Bertrand's face. He nodded to the two thugs who frowned, but tucked their weapons away. Why don't you take the young lady out of here before someone gets hurt? Zachary said. Tommy started forward, ready for a fight, but Zachary barred the kid's path. Decanes clasped his fingers firmly around the girl's shoulder and guided her toward the door. He paused and called back over his shoulder. Maybe you can teach the boy some manners, Mr... He trailed off, the question implicit. Nathan Zachary. One aristocratic eyebrow arched in surprise before Decanes could recover his mask of nonchalance. Mr. Zachary, your reputation precedes you. Zachary sighed. For years, his pirate gang, the Fortune Hunters, had been a small-time outfit. In the last year, they'd had a string of good luck, which meant his face had been plastered in the papers. The price of fame, he thought. So much for anonymity. What brings you to New Orleans, Mr. Zachary? Bertrand inquired. Not here on business, I hope. Plain trouble, actually. My bird's laid up on Pontchartrain Aerodrome for repairs, so I thought I'd cool my heels here for a bit. He shot a pointed glare at the gun that Decane's man, Benny, still had trained on them. It's supposed to be quiet here after Mardi Gras, after all. Decane gave a humorless chuckle. Put it away, Benny. It's time to leave. He nodded at Nathan. It's been a pleasure making your acquaintance. Another time, perhaps. With that, Decane exited the bar and ushered the girl into the back seat of the black car. Zachary's handsome face hardened as he kept his gaze on the departing foursome, their image distorted by the bar's grimy window. Benny was the last to leave. He glared at Nathan and added, Another time for sure, pal. Satisfied that the danger had passed, he looked back over his shoulder. The kid was a mess, drenched in sweat and shaking from the rush of adrenaline and anger. Go in the back and splash some cold water on your face, kid. Then we'll talk. Tommy began another splutter of protest, he was starting to sound like the faulty prop on an old warhawk, but Zachary cut him off. Just do it. The young pilot crashed through the kitchen doors in fury. It was a good thing the kid left the tap room when he did. Zachary watched as Decane got into the back seat behind the driver and turned to face the girl. It was obvious he was furious even before he slapped her hard across her face. She crumbled against the passenger window, her pale complexion marred by tears and a reddening handprint. For a moment, Zachary could see her look of utter defeat and misery. And then the Packard peeled away from the curb. Zachary's own anger flared. If anyone needed a lesson in manners, it was Bertrand Decane. 2. Boy Meets Girl Damn it, Zachary, Tommy growled. You should have let me send that bastard out of here in a box. Tommy looked angry enough to take the bar apart with his bare hands. He paced back and forth like a caged animal, his fists clenched. Finally, he snarled and kicked a chair across the floor. It crashed into the bar and broke apart. 
Nathan sized up the kid from his battered flight jacket to his cheap boots. There was no way Tommy could pay for damages if he busted up the bar. Nathan suppressed a wry grin. He'd wrecked more than his share of speakeasies in his time too, and like the kid, it was usually because of a woman. Calm down, kid. Let me buy you a cup of coffee. Zachary steered the young pilot to the table and firmly sat him down. Stay put. Take it easy on the furniture. Zachary waved over the bartender and passed him a few franc notes. Within moments, the bartender returned with a plate of the ubiquitous binets and two steaming cups of coffee. Nathan took a sip of the coffee and grimaced. It was hot and dark, just the way he liked it. Unfortunately, the locals insisted on putting chicory in it, which made it slightly less drinkable than the sludge in his plane's oil pan. On the other hand, the kid had downed enough rot gut for one day, so coffee, even bad coffee, was an improvement. Go ahead, kid, Zachary said. Looks like you could use some food. He pushed the plate of pastries across the table. Suspicion clouded Tommy's face. What's your story? Why would a big-time pirate want to buy breakfast for some stranger? Nathan shrugged. Good question. In your place, I probably wouldn't trust me either. But since I just kept you from getting shot, I'd say I'm probably as trustworthy as anyone else in this town. He pointed at the insignia on Tommy's shoulder. So what if my motives aren't completely pure? I know the Cajuns, or rather, I've had some dealings with your boss. And maybe there's some money to be made by cooperating. Helping you out would get me in solid with him. He paused, then leaned back his chair and grinned. Mostly, though, I got in the middle of that mess because you were disturbing my breakfast. The younger man chuckled and attacked the pastry like he hadn't eaten in a week. After a few minutes, Tommy came up for air, wiped the powdered sugar off his face, and reached across the table. I'm Tommy Boats, but everyone just calls me Tug. Everyone except for Emmy. His blue eyes got that glazed over look that said he had it pretty bad for the girl. Zachary knew that look. He'd seen it in the mirror a couple times himself. Although not recently, thank God. The kid had a good crip. Nice steady hand. He was probably a pretty fair pilot. If he'd kept that hair-triggered temper of his under control. You're from Texas, right? Zachary asked. Yes, sir. How'd you know? That flat twang was unmistakable. Oh, I've traveled around a bit. How'd you end up here? Well, I ran into some trouble a while back. Tommy flushed and looked around the room, as if he expected a posse to come through the door at any moment, waving a wanted poster at him. No need to spell it out, kid. You're not the only one who's got trouble on his heels. Look, Mr. Zachary... Nathan. Okay, Nathan. See, I had to leave Texas kind of sudden-like, I hitched a ride on the first plane out of there, and I ended up here. I kicked around for a day or two, but I didn't have anywhere to go. Decane and his cronies have tied up all the legal flying gigs in this town. I didn't have my own wings, and I couldn't get into the militia because of the trouble back home. So things were looking pretty bad. Why not sign up with the Foreign Legion? The garrison here always needs pilots, and they don't ask uncomfortable questions. I almost did. But things between the locals and the Legion are pretty tense. Seems like a good way to get shot down. I was considering going back to Austin and facing the music when I met up with Wildcar Thibodeau. He took me into the Ragin' Cajuns, gave me a plane and a place to hang my hat. Louis Thibodeau? When did he join the Cajuns? Nathan had met Thibodeau a while back. The KG Half Creole was running a sweet gambling operation along the Mississippi and was cheating the players blind, naturally. He was gregarious and charming, and as crooked as they came. Nathan liked him, despite the fact that Thibodeau had conned him out of a bundle. Huh? Tommy looked puzzled. Thibodeau runs the whole outfit. Zachary studied his coffee intently for a moment, and tried to keep a straight face. The Ragin' Cajuns was a pretty well-known pirate gang in these parts, going back some 200 years when ships sailed on water instead of air. The last Zachary had heard, the head of the gang was a man named Gaspard, 
a wily old con man who'd bragged that his roots went clear back to Jean Lafette. Of course, every two-bit grifter in French Louisiana made the same claim, but Gaspard was colorful, so his antics were tolerated. Under Gaspard's leadership, the Cajuns were airborne bandits who, in the old days, were likely to hand a lady a rose with a flourish as they took the diamonds off her neck. Despite their generally lawless activities in the past several years, they had actually done a lot to help the poor folks in the bayou, who had gotten crushed under the wheels of the French Louisiana government. So the locals protected them when the law tried to shut the Cajuns down. And now Gaspard was out of the picture. And Wildcard Thibodeau was the new top dog? Perfect. The Cajuns have been real good to me, Tommy continued. Lou gave me my own plane, a fury, and let me fix her up so she really purrs. Zachary smiled. Listening to Tommy talk about his plane, he could tell the kid loved to fly, but there was something guarded even in his rapturous description. It's just that, well, my daddy raised me to respect the law, and the Cajuns are sorta on the other side of it, if you know what I mean. I just don't feel real comfortable having to look over my shoulder for militia and such when I'm flying. Zachary had been on the wrong side of the law for most of his career. He nodded. Enough said. So, what's the story with you and that rich guy? Tommy's blue eyes flashed. Bertrand Decane, he said, his voice flat. I'm telling you, Nathan, you should have let me finish that son of a bitch off. Throttle back a second, kid, Nathan said. From where I was sitting, it looked like you were the one who was going to get his ticket punched. Tommy glowered, but before he could protest, Nathan cut him off, his voice kind. Nothing to be ashamed of, Tommy. I've been outgunned myself on occasion. I just try not to make a habit of it. So, who's the girl? Tommy relaxed a bit. Emmeline Marie Fontenu. Emmy. She's... She's... The young pilot paused, his face red. She's special, Zachary said. Happens to the best of us, kid. And I take it Bertrand is the competition? No, sir! Tommy's fist pounded the table. I love Emmy, and she loves me. The problem is her guardian, Henry Decane. See, Emmy lost her folks when she was real young. Her daddy was partners with old man Decane. So here she was, an orphan child with no relatives, and a pile of dough she inherited. Old man Decane, he becomes her guardian. Make sure she's treated real good like a princess, best of everything. Sounds like a decent enough thing to do, Nathan said. No way. Henry Decane only cares about money, and Emmy's folks died rich. Emmy wants the money, so he's forcing Emmy to marry Bertrand, to keep her trust money under his thumb. Zachary's interest was piqued at the mention of trust money. He had a soft spot for damsels in distress, especially beautiful ones who were swimming in dough. Although the adored Miss Emmy was a little shy and retiring for his taste, there was no denying that she was a looker. He imagined it wouldn't be too hard to wake up every morning knowing that you were married to that kind of beauty and that kind of money. Tommy continued. See, Emmy, she doesn't care about the money. She'd up and leave it if she could, and me? I don't want to marry her because of the money. Hell, a man's supposed to support a woman, not the other way around, right? Nathan nodded and hoped he looked convincing. He could think of a couple ladies who were more than welcome to support him. The kid's sincerity made him feel old and a little sad. Kid, he wanted to say, you hang on to that dream as long as you can. You'll find out that sometimes in the real world, things just don't work out like they do in fairy tales. So, what are you going to do? Zachary interjected. You can't just run off with her. Bertrand strikes me as the kind of fellow who doesn't like it when people take things that belong to him. You run off with Emmy. His guys will gun you down like a dog. Tommy shrugged. Yep, I figured that out pretty quick, so I'm going to have to beat these creeps at their own game. That's why I was meeting Emmy today, to tell her my plan. He paused, a mischievous grin creasing his handsome face. See, Henri Decane is a respected pillar of the community, but he's as dirty as yesterday's dishwater. He runs all sorts of gambling outfits and betting parlors. Plus, he sponsors damn near all the air racing in Louisiana. 
all of it illegal, and all of it with cash prizes. The next race is the day after tomorrow, and the payoff is a cool twenty grand. Zachary gave a low whistle. That's quite a prize, and you figure on collecting it. Well, the way I see it, I spend more time out there flying the bayou than they do. My plan is better and faster than most of the local racers' rigs. I can probably beat anyone Decane throws at me. I win the race, get the twenty grand, and then Emmy and me get the hell out of town. Maybe Hollywood or Pacifica, someplace like that. That's a pretty big if, Tommy. Is your plane in shape for that kind of race? The young Texan's face fell. That's the problem. I can win the race, but I gotta make a couple of repairs to my bird. And the parts ain't cheap. Thibodeau ain't eager to spend the Cajun's money on some damn fool race. I don't mean no disrespect, but... A sly look crossed Tommy's face as he launched into an approximation of the local dialect. Tommy, mon garçon, how far you think the twenty grand will go? Emmy's not some little bayou girl gonna be happy with the life of a poor man. Zachary smiled at the Texan's imitation of his leader. He does have a point, Tommy. I'm sure Emmy loves you, but if she's been raised on Chateaubriand and Champagne... She may not be ready for beans and beer. Tommy looked defiant. She says she doesn't care where we live as long as we're together. Zachary took another sip of his bitter coffee and considered the situation, looking for all the angles. The smart play was to leave this dime store Romeo and Juliet act to play out on its own. On the other hand, there was money to be made here. An inheritance, a corrupt local businessman, and illegal cash racing all added up to a nice, juicy score. The ace sighed. There was no point in kidding himself. There was more to this caper than money. He despised bullies, and there was no reason that Père Fille de Caen were a match set. The pit of his stomach went cold as he remembered the miserable look on Emmy's face after Bertrand slapped her. Finally, he stood up, and clapped Tommy on the shoulder. Come on, kid. Let's go see your boss. I have a feeling we can work something out.